Okay. Um, good afternoon again and welcome. Thank you all for coming and thank you for your interest in beekeepers and beekeeping because I'll tell you what, the bees are in trouble. And between colony collapse disorder, between pesticides, which I've recently had an experience with and it's not fun, and between all the different mites and um, pests that they're facing, you know, we need you. So my name is Roxanne Kimball and I'm here to help you become beekeepers. Um, there's a lot to cover here. Um, beekeeping is really exciting, it's rewarding. Um, you're going to get all kinds of benefits besides pollinating your garden and that wonderful honey and the wax. And, I mean, you can get your family involved in this. So it's, it is a really cool hobby. Um, with honey selling now, we were just talking about this, about seven bucks a pint. And if you have a good, strong colony, and in a good year where you don't have too much rain, you don't have a, too little rain, but in a, rainfall is real important, um, you can get almost five gallons per hive. Wow. So, you know, you do the math. That's not a little bit. And that's saving a lot for yourself as well. Okay, honey lasts forever. It um, is great, and they're proving more and more. It's awesome for um, allergies and even the common cold. Uh, plus that, they're showing the antibacterial benefits uh, for wounds and burns is fantastic. So, now I know there's a lot to, to learn here and I'm going to go kind of rapidly, but I really, really need to stress, go to the library, go to a bookstore, go to Amazon.com. That's I'm their best customer. Um, there's a ton of books available and you have to buy these because these are like Bibles. I never thought I'd buy a book that called me a dummy, but this is a fantastic book. It makes it really simple. You're, the whole time you're going to be beekeeping, you will be, be referring to these. Um, if you want to get certified, you'll need to have this one. This is put out by the guy at UGA. Um, he's got everything in there. Um, a lot of these are good. This is great. Um, by all means, definitely subscribe to the American Bee Journal. Right? Right here. Um, no. It's up here somewhere. No, it's AmericanBeeJournal.com. Real hard. This is a great magazine. You will learn a lot. And you will continue to learn. It's cheap um, and, and it's, re it's really great. It, it's put out by Date Ant. Um, I do have some numbers up here. Uh, these are suppliers for equipment. These are your apiaries that you're going to order your equipment from. Rossman I do, does sell bees as well. And uh, Bobby and Gail, b and Honey Farms, he sells bees and he's taking orders now and you will get them by May, and I think both of these guys, if you order them this week, you'll be getting your bees by May. Um, and he does, uh, he does um, supplies as well. He is right here in Statesboro, so it's not a far drive. I have a ton of his cards and stuff right there, so um, help yourself to that. Um, join a bee club. Um, this is a Coastal Empire Bee uh, Keeping. Um, that's their website. You just go to their website and look, but you know, for me, it was kind of hard to go to Savannah. I did, I did it the first year, and I just got exhausted. I couldn't drive it. It's three hours in one night. Um, so I just, you know, I couldn't go. I keep in contact with them via email. Maybe we can start one down here. Bobby's trying to get one around the Statesboro area. And if we get enough people around here, maybe the Tattnall, uh, Toombs County area, you know, we could start our own. And, and it's wonderful, because it's great to learn from other people and their mistakes. Um, <laughs> Okay, uh, I am going to start out, and, and I am going to go fast, but since it's a small group, I, we can probably do questions. I'm going to start out a little bit over the colony, what happens inside the hive. Um, and then I'm going to go through and I'm going to show you uh, what a hive and how to set it up, how, and that, everything to set it up in your equipment. And then we're going to move right on into um, getting your package of bees and then installing it. If we have time, I'm going to try to go over some pests and diseases. If we don't have time, it's all in the books. It's serious, and you need to read on it. And even if we do get to touch up on it, read about the diseases and especially the pests, because um, that is the main culprit. Okay, um, there are three kinds of members in a colony. You've got your um, adult worker bee. About 95% of your colony is made up of the worker bee. They're females. Everybody in here is a female except for him. And there's a few of those and one queen. Only one queen per colony. And a colony cannot exist without the queen. 
So the adult worker bee does all the work. The queen does nothing but lay eggs. Well, she reproduces, and, <coughs> but you know, she's pretty much the queen bee. And the drone, he's just the male. He does nothing for the colony. Okay, so you're rolling your eyes going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, here's the bad news. He dies after he mates. So the um, queen bee, after she emerges from her cell, she will go on several days of mating flights. And she can mate up to 10, 15 drones um, per mating period. And then that will enable her to lay eggs for anywhere from two, she can live to four years. So usually she'll go gangbusters at, four, at first. They'll lay up to 1,500 eggs a day their first year. And then it'll kind of slowly dwindle. A lot of people replace their queens after the first year. You know, I've done both. I've said, let the bees decide when she needs to be replaced. And they will. If she quits laying or she gets sick or dies, the bees will create a new one. I'm going to do that here in just a minute. Um, but the, the, it, it's a typical insect in that you have the four stages, egg, larva, pupa, and then adult. So a bee, after the queen lays an egg in a cell, there's about three days where it spends as an egg. And then it goes into the uh, larva stage. Now at this stage, up until this stage of three days, they're all being fed royal jelly. Okay, at the four day stage, the larvae either becomes, at this point, this is kind of the deciding factor, a queen. If they need the queen, they'll make it continuously feeding it royal jelly. If not, it will become a worker bee or perhaps a drone and it will start looking like a little white grub. When you go in there, it's going to look like a little C. It's kind of curled up in that little cell and it looks like a little grub. It goes into, from the larva into the prepupa. Then the, um, the bees will cap that little cell with wax and then it continues to develop as a pupa and eventually after 21 days for an adult worker bee, it will emerge. Only 16 days for a queen bee. Now she's fed the entire time royal jelly, so that's why she's going to be bigger and why she can only stay in there for 16 days. Once she emerges, because usually they're not stupid, they're not saying, oh, we're only going to raise one and take the chance that something happens. They're going to pick about six to ten larvae and, and make them all queens. Figuring one out of six, I have pretty good odds there. So they'll make them all into um, queen cells. The first one that emerge, emerges, it she'll go and kill the rest. So there'll only be one. And, um, uh, and again, you'll be able to recognize these cells when you go in and you do your inspection. The, You'll look at the, the comb and it'll look like cardboard. All the brood in there will look like cardboard. It's, they're all kind of regularly shaped, capped cells. The drone cells, and there isn't that many. In the, in the spring, when the mating is happening and everything's flurrying and maybe you get new queens, there may be a, a hundred drones in there. But in the winter, these guys aren't stupid. They're going, look, you guys are doing nothing for the colony. You're out of here. And there may only be one or two drones running around in the fall. So um, uh, she, her, her cell will look like a peanut. It's long and elongated and it'll kind of hang vertically. So you can tell when you look at it and you go, holy cow, there's five queen cells here. What's going on? Well, depending on where the queen cells are, either your queen has quit laying or is dead, but either way they're trying to get a new one. Or if the, the queen cells you're seeing are at the bottom of your frames, they're getting ready to swarm, and, and we won't go into that because that's not a good thing. Okay, um, so the dr drone cells, he's bigger, and when you first look into your colony and you're not real, real experienced looking at all these bees, you're going to look down there and you're going to say, oh, I see five queens, because the drones are much bigger and they really look like, the, uh, they look so much bigger that you're going to go, that's the queen. Well, really, if you look, she's got a really, really long body. And when you see her tromping around there with the rest of them, you'll go, oh, there she is. Um, but it does take a while, and because she is very elusive and hard to find, when you order your bees, make sure they mark her. And they put a little dot on her. And when you pick up your frames and start looking, she pops out. And, and then, you know, oh, there she is. 
And then if you see a queen that's not marked, you'll go, hmm, what happened to my marked queen? Well, obviously she died or took off or the bees didn't like her, so they replaced her. So you, that's why you get your queens marked. Um, so anyway, that's basically what goes on in there. Um, when you go in and do your inspection, you're basically looking for a brood pattern, brood being the babies, the way, she's, the, way the queen is laying her eggs. And again, you'll see clear fluid, and the fluid will have a little teeny weeny grain of what looks like rice in it. You almost have to hold it up to the light with the sun behind you to see it, or even a magnifying glass, because they're really hard to see. And um, you'll be looking for the little grubs, <coughs> little, and then you'll be looking for the capped brood. If you see all that, you've got a queen. You don't have to see her, because you've got all that going on there. So that's a good thing. OK, let's go into equipment first. Um, and before we do that, I want to talk about location. As they say, location, location, location. It is everything here as well. Um, my first year, um, I put all my bees in a nice, low, shady spot because I said, when I go in there in the Georgia sun, I want to be comfortable. And so it's lots of shade. It was in a lower area, kind of moisture hung around there. Everything you're not supposed to do. I lost all of them eventually. But um, you really want to pick a place that's um, open sunlight in the morning. So with, you're going to face this kind of southeasterly. And if you can't, that's okay, but it does get them in the winter heated up quicker, you know, when the sun shines on them first thing in the morning, it's going to heat this, the entrance up, get them going, and maybe they'll come out and do their little cleansing flights. Um, plus that, uh, in the summer, when it first starts coming up, they're going to get out there the minute the sun comes up. And if it's in their entrance and that light comes in there, they're going. If you have it facing the other way, they, they really have to wait a little longer. So it's a good idea if you can face them southeast, that's great. You want them someplace a little bit high, whatever, you, whatever you don't want it wet. Um, they don't like a lot of moisture. Um, look for a place that's got some kind of water. If you don't look near a pond, you don't have a water feature, your neighbors don't have so many pools, um, you can put out a pail or a bucket. Just fill it with water and put a couple sticks in it, or um, I keep a two by four in there. Um, or corks will work because bees don't swim, so they're going to drown if they go in there for water. So, um, and sometimes you can see them, they're all, they'll be all lined up on a stick waiting to go in there and get water. How the summer, far away is it needed? I mean, how far away is considered normal? Distance? Well, bees will fly up to two miles to forage. The closer, the better. I have a big pond at my house, mm -hmm. and, and I still keep a bucket of water close by. Now, I never see the bees in the water because I think. They'd much rather go over to my neighbor's swimming pool than do my pond, or my water feature, or my bucket. I never see them drink water. So, and my neighbor says all the time, she goes, I think your bees are in my pool. You um, said I'm putting the hive in a low spot, and usually it's near the pond, so. I know, I know. Well, ours is high, yeah, exactly. And I do have some by a pond, but it's dry. So mm -hmm. that's the big thing, is you don't want like a swampy area. But if it's like four or five hundred yards away, you... I know. They'll, they'll go a long way. My thing is, they're collecting honey and they're collecting nectar. And they're really, when you see them land here, it's like they're like a 747. They're going to come in and they're going to go pow. And you'll see them land here. It looks like they're really heavy. And they've got all this pollen on their back and their legs. And, and their it's little honey stomachs are full. And they're going to climb in there. And you, you're going to go, oh, you know what? I've got to get some water closer. Because they're going to come right back out and look for water. And that's how they keep the colony cool. And that's how, and especially if it's really hot, that's how they're going to, you know, they're going to use water in there to keep it cool. And what they drink and what they use to um, feed the brood and mix it with the, everything. So it's a very, very important. But again, you know, you can have it close, a pond, a couple hundred yards away is fine. Um, hive stand, you can put this on cinder blocks. You can buy a hive stand. You can make a hive stand. Uh, in the catalogs, they sell them. They're all good. You want it off the ground and level. So I've got all mine on cinder blocks. Um, so you'll just put this on the cinder blocks like that. Uh, when you're painting, um, and, and you can buy these pre-painted and pre-put together. You know, it's just how much work you want to do. Um, I'm cheap, so I put all mine together and I painted them. And um, you want to use a good um, base coat uh, and then uh, just a really good uh, exterior paint. Unless you want to paint them every year. You know, so. Um, Is color better? Um, not really. I have mine all kinds of colors. Um, I think probably black wouldn't work good or dark 
because you know you don't want heat absorbing. And also, I've heard people say that these don't like dark colors. Of course, I always go out there in blue jeans, and they don't bother me in blue jeans, but I don't know about their hives. Everybody has very light colors, and I think that's mostly for the sun. Um, so, after you get that on, you're going to get this, that, that is the, um, uh, what your hive stand is. This is your bottom board. Uh, I just found out that they do sell them now like this, in, if you're buying a package. If you're not, um, like for me, when, when I first bought all these, they weren't putting, you had to buy them separately. So I made this. It's real easy. You take the boards that they give you, because you're going to put this together too. Um, just take one of the boards that they give you. You'll use um, wood glue and nails, and then just use, um, I don't know, is this 10 gauge wire? Is that what that is? Whatever. Huh? It's, it's, just, it's just, yeah, hardware. You can buy it at the hardware store. Um, and then just, you'll tack that onto the top part. But, you know, buy one, if you're going to have one, just buy one and see how it's made and then do it. But now you can buy these with your um, kits. They'll come. I cannot overemphasize the need to have a screen bottom board. They have made so much difference in, in keeping healthy bees. Not only does it add ventilation, but the Varroa mite problem, which is a huge problem, you'll get the mites falling off the bees and they'll fall right through here and then they're gone. If this is solid, they just pick themselves up, dust themselves off, and climb on another bee. So you're not solving the problem. Ventilation is also kind of an issue. It, it tends to build up a lot of moisture in there if you have um, solid boards. Um, so this is a great, great deal in the last couple years. That's going to fit right on there. Okay. Does it, uh, does it matter in terms of the problem after hot beaters? Um, hive beetles, you know, they're a problem, period. I don't think that the bottom board does much because what, what's going to happen is they come down here and they fall down anyway to um, breed in the sand and the stuff like that, and then they just climb back up. So, you know, it doesn't make, make much difference for hive beetles. But um, the mites are the big problem. Okay, from there, um, you're going to go into your um, main hive body, and now you, you're going to have to make some decisions here because it's going to be up to your physical limitations. This is called a deep super. Okay, it's the main brood box. This is a big box. It has 10 frames in it right now. And this is going to sit up here like this. When this is full of honey and brood and bees, it can weigh 100 pounds. Okay, it's really heavy. Um, I don't move mine too much. I'll move mine maybe in the spring, right before they get going. And that's and I just because I always have two of these, and I'll just flip flop them because bees like to move up. I, in my mind, I'm thinking I won't swarm if I move my boxes around, but you know they do what they do. Uh, if this is going to be an issue for you, there's a smaller box. It's called a medium super. It's about three quarters this size, and it weighs maybe 60 pounds full, so it's not real big. Um, if you want to go with all small, this is actually called a honey super, but it, you can see it's much, much smaller. You can use all of these boxes for your brood as well as your honey. The advantage to doing that is you only have to buy one size frame. I've got two. I've got, I've got to buy the big ones and I've got to buy the small ones. I know a guy I just bought a bunch of um, hives and colonies from. He was selling all his uh, tall boxes. Because all he he's doing everything in medium boxes. He doesn't have any smalls. He doesn't have any talls. Everything's medium, one size frame. It's not a bad idea. If you really can't lift even those, you can do what's called a nuke or a nucleus. Now this is on half the size of that, and it only has five frames in it, and it doesn't weigh that much. And there is a lot of a lot of thought to bees tend to move up. That's just their natural, maybe from living in trees, but they like to move up. So the thought process here is, you put one of these on, you add another, you add another, you add another. Well, they're just going to keep moving up. You'll find in these boxes right here, you may get, I have bees that will not build in the outer, in the outer um, frames. They just don't go up there. So what I end up having to do is after a year, I have to say, okay, I'll fix you guys, and I move it to the middle. So 
That's the only way, because they just won't go out there. So, that's one of my friends would not to do. Anyway, um, so this is, this is a possibility too. There are some people who just have these. And I, I actually keep always spare, because if you're gonna capture swarms, this is a great way to do it. Or you've got a really weak, small colony, and you need to put them in something smaller, you can do this and buy a queen. So, you know, just, oh, good idea to have. Okay, next thing is, these are called your frames. If you scrimp on putting together anything, this is not the thing to do it on, and I'll show you why. This is nailed, was nailed, but it just, it pulled through. So they, they give you nails, and they give you instructions, and they tell you all this stuff to do. I probably didn't glue that one. They tell you to put your nails in this way, but what happens is when this gets heavy, the nails are going to pull right out. So put your nails in horizontally. Don't scrimp on nails. Uh, use, you know, I got small nails here, big nails here. These take a ton of abuse, tons. And they're not expensive, but if you don't need, you know, like this one, now I got to go home and, you know, figure out a way to repair this. You know, or probably what I'll do is throw it away. Um, what are your thoughts on the plastic ones? It's what? What are your thoughts on plastic ones? Well, Bobby was just in here, Bobby Colson. He's, he's this guy. And he, he doesn't like them. And he says um, his bees don't like them. And, uh, and, and there are people that say don't mix them. But these don't require any assembly. They are easy, easy, easy. You can't destroy them. You can drop them. They may crack, but you know, but duh. Do the bees like them? You, you know, it depends on your bees. My, my bee, I, and I have them mixed, and people say, oh, you don't mix your wooden with your plastic. So, well, I did. And, um, and they're still drawing it out. Now, if they don't like it, and you've invested in them, here's a little secret. Take some beeswax like this, melt it down, and just run some over it with a little pe one of those little sponge brushes. I guarantee they'll like it. I guarantee it. <laughs> So if you do decide to invest in that and your bees don't like it, they do something weird or funky, um, just take some beeswax and it, it, it's amazing what they will do. Okay, when you get these, um, they probably will have little perforations on the corners. If they do, you can just bend them back. If not, take some shears, garden shears, and just clip. The reason you do this is it just makes it easier for the bees to go from one side to the other and to, to go throughout the um, hive real easy. Um, that's the only reason. And they just started doing this a few years ago. And this goes to the bottom. So um, I generally just flip mine in like here on the top and then just voila, that's it. So um, it is advisable, we were talking about this too, um, to change them out every um, three to five years. I'll show you what brood comb looks like. Brood comb, which is just the babies, not the honey looks like this. It's really dark and ugly. And um, you are going to treat for mites, and you are going to treat for, for tracheomites and probably other diseases. Um, and everybody use some, uses some kind of pesticide or fertilizer or something. Well, you get all that in here. And it stays. This is wax. It stays. And so um, about, you know, three, anywhere from three to five, whenever you can, just pop this thing out. They're not expensive. It, and if you want, clean, the, clean it off. You can just wash it off and pop it back in there. But, you know, get rid of this stuff or, um, I don't know, find, find a way to do something with it. I, I like to melt it down and just put it in little balls and say, hey, look, this is beeswax. <laughs> it's really ugly. Um, but... Uh, you know, it's just, it's just one of those clean practices. It may, may take time, and if you, if you don't have time, like I said, just pop them off. I think these things are 50 or 60 cents. They're not that much. So, you know, why not just, and you know, if, if you have a bunch of colonies, and mine are all intermixed, I just put like uh, 12, 11, 10, whatever year I put them in there. So, and I try to keep them all the same, but I've just been in there and noticed I've got some 10 and 11s in, so um, I'll wait on those. Um, okay, so now you have a broken frame. So now you have 10 in here like this, and let's 
we're not going to talk about honey yet, but let's just say this is a, your first package. This is called the inner cover. It's got a notch here. Don't paint this. Don't, and don't paint the inside of your boxes. Bees don't like paint. So um, that goes like on that. This ventilation hole goes to the front. And when you put your telescoping cover on, when you put it on, you want to make sure that you push it all the way forward so the bees can get up underneath here and into that little hole. Okay, because that's how they come in and out. They'll go in and out this front as well as they will here. This does not have a hole in it like this. This is how yours will probably come. I put holes in all of mine like this. And as a matter of fact, Bobby said, hey, that's my cover. Probably is. But you can, this, is, this is very cheap, very easy. The reason I put this hole in it is it's an easy, easy way to feed your bees. Um, I use a two-quart jar, because I don't like to go out there a lot and feed them. But they'll go through this in a couple days. And I've got a little just canning jar, lid, anything. Poke a bunch of holes in it. Can you all see that? There's a bunch of holes. You'll fill this with sugar water, 50-50, completely um, dissolved sugar and cool, and you'll just pop that on there like that. I mean, and they will take that sugar water, and that's how your first package of bees are going to be fed until the honey flow is really going strong and they have enough. Because this is what they're going to make their comb out of and their food. Okay, time to add, um, you're, you're going strong, and now it's time that you add a honey super. So, this is a queen excluder. As the name implies, it excludes the queen. She's too small, too big to fit through this grid. So what you're doing is by putting it on there, and then putting your honey super on top, the bees are now going to only put honey in here. No brood. So when you go to extract this stuff, you're not going to get little baby brood. I've done that. So you got little floating babies in your honey. It's kind of not pretty. <laughs> anyway, um, so you know, and a lot of people like Bobby, uh, this guy, he doesn't use these, and he he says, well, the queen isn't going to climb above the um, honey in here. So he, you know, he doesn't use them. That's fine. I mean, whatever works. You know, like if there's as many ways to keep bees as there are beekeepers. Find a way that works for you. Um, okay, so other equipment. Um, this is a uh, entrance reducer, um, and it comes up. This is used to restrict the entrance of uh, the bees coming and going. You will probably use this when you first get your bees, just to kind of keep them in there and say, okay, you guys stay home, and you know, give them a little way to get out. But really, it's kind of you don't want them all massively leaving at once. So, um, so you'll just use this for a few weeks when you first get them. If it's a cold, cold winter, or you get a lot of wind, you can use it in the winter, and it just kind of restricts all the, because um, they're not going to be coming in and out a lot, so it will restrict um, the amount of airflow going in there. And if you get robbing, and you will see this maybe later, but um, it can be a problem at certain times of the year, because bees are opportunists. If they see a weak colony, and there's food in there to be got, they are going to spread that around and every bee in the neighborhood is going to come and try to take that, that um, honey. So um, you can kind of give the bees in here a fighting chance and, and put a reducer in there and that just gives them less space to defend. So, and, and you'll have to learn to recognize the difference between robbing and just bees going out and doing what they do. Um, there, is a, there is kind of a difference. I've only seen it a couple times. And when I saw it, I said, they're robbing. And I went in there in two days, and there wasn't a thing in there. Not a thing. So in just a matter of two days, the colony was gone. So it was really sad. Um, let's see. OK, um, stuff you'll need. The first thing, a big thing, is this is a hive tool. By two, because they grow legs and they move around. So, <laughs> I put one in my pocket like this. I'm going out to my bee yard. Of course, I have a bucket, and it's got all my stuff in it, and I always have one in there. And I'm going, where did my hive tool go? What did I do with my hive tool? You know, it's like glasses. Where are my glasses? 
So um, always, you know, keep two because you're not going to go. Don't go out to your bee yard without this. I mean, there's nothing you can do without it. You're going to use this to pry these frames apart because the bees are going to glue all this together. So you'll use it to pry them apart. You'll, you know, use them to. Uh, if you want to take these apart, believe me, this is all going to get glued. You'll, you'll have to do like that. Um, you'll start here and you'll kind of go. And you'll do this. You'll figure this out. This tool is invaluable. So keep two on hand. And I only have one with me because the other one grew lights. Um, this um, is your second most valuable tool. It's a smoker. Um, takes a little bit of an art to learn how to light it and keep it going uh, when you go out for your inspections. Um, I use pine straw. I found that works great. You can buy. Um, you can buy fuel. This is it. Um, I guess it works great. I bought it and don't know why. And um, but pine straw leaves, uh, wood shavings. That all works great. Um, you'll light it a little bit at the bottom, like a newspaper. Um, I always take this also out with me because my I, I tend to not like to smoke a lot. Um, it's um, not disruptive to the bees, but I, what happens is um, the idea be behind smoking is. I think not only does it mask their pheromones and they're sending out signals that, hey, something's happening in here, um, but it, um, some people think that it gives them the idea that there's a fire coming and they start to really gorge on honey and they'll just eat everything in there. And, you know, so if I'm just going in there to look for pests or to see how they're doing or if they have, I don't smoke. I only go in there if I'm doing a major inspection. I mean, that I use this. So generally, um, between all my colonies, it's going to go out a couple times. So I always bring um, a lighter and, you know, have tons of fuel with me. Um, so you'll just, um, after you get it lit, you'll throw a handful of pine needles in there. You'll just kind of get that bellows going, you know, get it, get it up and running. And pretty, pretty soon you'll see the smoke coming out. See, it's time to clean mine. But anyway, um, yeah, so just a look. You'll, you'll smoke a little bit here. You know, just wait a couple minutes. These are kind of going to go, hmm, what's going on in here? Then you'll lift the cover. You'll smoke a little bit here. It doesn't take a lot. And then just give them a while to, to settle down. And you'll pop the hive, the cover, and they'll be very nice and friendly. I, I have one colony that I won't even go near without smoke. I mean, I won't even go near. It is nasty. And if that, this year, um, I just thought a couple years ago, if that colony is this bad this year, I'm going to kill that queen off with her head and get a new one. Because remember, queen of the genetics, so she's producing these little mean, nasty bees. A bee brush, you don't have to have, but I mean, it's, if, you're, if you're not going to use something to get your bees off your frames when you do the um, harvest the honey, and I use um, a few more, um, it's I think the most disruptive, it, you can buy the um, Stuff. It's basically a, um, a board like that cover right there that you put on top of here. And apparently the bees don't like the smell because they all head down. So you can, after five minutes, there won't be a bee in your honey super. Works fast, great. Um, this is, you know, we talked a little bit about that hole, cutting that hole in the top and feeding. This is an alternative, especially if you're using this, it works really good. Um, it's called a Boardman feeder, and you just put it under here, and you can put your jar, um, you can put your jar right in here. <coughs> the problem with doing it with that is because it's close to the entrance, everybody knows it's there, and so ants know it's there, um, spiders know it's there, and other bees know it's there. So uh, on my big colonies, I I don't use these. I just use it on the small ones because you've got a real small area for them to defend here. Um, but anyway, so I've got a ton of these. I don't like them. Uh, uh, veils, um, pick one that you like. There's a ton of them. This one, I love this one. It works great in the summer because it's really light, and you do want something really light. Um, my husband, for some reason, likes this thing. But, you know, it's a hard hat with a little veil. Great. I like him to use that. I do use gloves. A lot of people don't, you know, kind of poo-poo that. I don't like to get stuck. And, I, and I'm really not that careful. So um, I do wear these gloves, but I am careful about not killing my bees. So they say that when you wear gloves, you can't feel what you're doing. 
whatever. So like I said, everybody has a different way of doing things. So now you are getting your first package of bees. Here they come. You went to um, the apiary to pick them up or you had them delivered and um, you're getting ready to put them in. Again, there's a ton of different ways to do this, but they're going to come in something like this. But what's gonna, what, what will be here is, they're going to be like this. This is about, this, usually it's a three pound package, which means there's 10,000 bees in here. So there'll be a little cage here. And this is going to have your queen in it and a couple of her attendants. And then there's going to be a tin can of sugar, sugar water, syrup, but the 50-50. So first thing you're going to do, and um, yeah, here, here again, you can read about that, some people do. I haven't done this, but... You can either spray them with just water or sugar water. The sugar water they'll kind of lick off, but it basically keeps them just from flying all over the place. And, and, it, and for your first package, just take a 50-50 some of that sugar water that you made, that syrup, put it in your little spray bottle. And as you go out there right before you, um, you know, again, you're going to use your little hive tool and you're going to pry the, the can off. You're going to take the queen out, put the can or a, some kind of a, a top over it so they don't all come out and you can just kind of spray them a little bit. Kind of gentles them down. They're going, ooh, cool, sugar water. And it's right here. Um, we don't have to suck it out. So they get all involved in that and they're not going to go flying around either. Um, so now you want to look at your queen. She should be marked. She's going to have that nice little pretty dot here. And you're going to go, oh, look how cool. And I don't know what color this year is. Blue maybe? Blue or yellow. Um, but what you'll do is if you have this nice little hat on it, that's cool. Um, you're going to take out, I take out five frames. I take out half of them. And I'm just going to take out four here. And you're going to take her, and there's going to be a cork on both sides. It's easier to see here. There's a little cork there, and I'll pass this around. And there's going to be another cork on this side. And actually in between, and in this box here, there's some of that fondant, that, mm, I don't know what that is, fondant candy. And you're going to take a little um, nail and remove the cork out of the candy side. And this way, and then you're going to punch a tiny little hole in that fondant. And that just allows the rest of the bees to kind of grab onto the candy and start chew chewing through. Because they will be the ones that release the queen. If they don't like her, they're not going to let her out. It may take them longer, but, you know, let them do their thing. So um, this way, they're kind of, she's kind of released slowly. So if, if you've got the little lid like this, you can just put this between two frames like that. And if you don't have the um, thing, I have one over here, what did I do with it? I just put a um, little piece of wire or a piece of, um, just a little, little piece of wire. You can use a um, paper, a paper clip and just whack it through the wire and then you can hang this up. Make sure you ha hang the candy side up. So when they chew through this, if there's any dead bees in there, they're not going to block her access. Like if you hung it upside down, she may not be able to get out. So I hang it with the candy upside, just like right in there inside the two frames. And then you'll take this, you'll take your top off, and you'll just set it right, right in there like that. Put the top cover on. And the other cover, and you're out of here. They're done, okay? Tomorrow, next day, okay, you want to take that box out. If you leave that box in there, they make a mess. You know, go in there and get it out as soon as you can. If you put them in in the morning, you can probably take it out in the, in the evening because they will build this stuff everywhere. And it looks pretty, but you, you want this on here. You don't want this in the middle of nowhere. Um, so go in there and take out this box. There's still going to be bees in here. I just kind of put it at the entrance here. You can shake a little bit of it out, but they're, you know, they're stubborn. So you can just put it in. They'll climb out and they'll crawl in here. Um, you can check, check on your queen. Where'd she go? Oh, she's in there somewhere. You can check on your queen. If she's not out, put her back in and let her stay for another couple days. If she's out, great. Take the, take the queen cage out and put the other frames back in. Close it up, and you're done. Now, when do you take the queen out, or when are you going to check on her again? 
give her another, this is day two, give her another three days. Um, sometimes it just takes some time. Go in there again, so this would be day five, and look, look in there, and you can smoke them a little bit if, if you feel nervous, but you're not going to be that much time in there. There's not a lot of bees. It doesn't matter, whatever you feel comfortable doing. Go in there, look at her, you're going to pull her out. If she's still in there, sorry, but you have to intervene. Take that little um, nail you had and just um, on the other side where the cork is, just pull out the cork. And when you do that, put your finger over the hole. This is why I, I don't clip mine because I'm careful. But put your finger over so she doesn't escape. And I see people all the time, my queen, it fell on the grass. Well, did you have your finger over the hole? What hole? The hole you just made. So put them, in, then you can just slide her in like this. Okay, now what will happen? That that's, that's a plugged hole. Um, what will happen is she'll come out on her own. She'll just walk out. Okay, so she should just be fine. And in a couple hours, you can just remove this. And the bees are going to be on their own. They're going to be doing what they do. Now all you got to do is make sure that this, that this is, that they always have sugar water. Because right now, they're really, really, really busy building these things up so she can start laying. So you want to give her as much of this as you possibly can so they can get this comb drawn and then she'll start laying. I mean, she'll start laying the second day she's out when she has comb. And again, 1,500 eggs a day, she's going to need some heavy-duty workers out there. So just keep this full. Um, if you get your bees in May, your honey flow is almost over. So you probably are going to have to be feeding them until the fall. Um, and then you got the golden rod and the next uh, fall flow coming. And you can stop feeding them then, and then you'll just have to kind of monitor and look in there and see how much honey they want to uh, have in there. Most of the time, um, your first year, you'll probably be feeding them mostly up until December. You want, them to make, you want to make sure they have enough food for the winter. Okay? It's going to depend on how many bees you have in there and how, and how many boxes you have in there. Um, I, you know, they say, oh, it's got to weigh like 70 pounds, and they do all this, and I said, I don't know how much 70 pounds weighs, I'm not lifting that box. Um, but you can look in there and look in a couple frames, and if you don't see a lot of honey in those frames, and you don't see a lot of food, feed them more. Because you, you just spent a lot of time and a lot of money through the spring and the summer, don't let them die of starvation. Fall, you're also going to start treating for... Um, Pests have time. So, um, again, it's really, really important that you treat for mites. Let's talk a little bit about your first inspection, though, because I want you to know what you're going to be looking for. Um, your first inspection is going to be a few weeks. Give it about two, three weeks for the bees to kind of settle down. Um, these are, I didn't really mention these because these are optional. These are called um, frame holders. I love them. Um, I can put them on the end and then... Um, now, some people say different things. Again, this is, this is up to you. You'll find out what works. Some people say, oh, only take out the very last one and then start here. Well, you know what? I don't want to spend that much time in here. I really don't. So I just start right in the middle because that's where the action is. So I kind of pry them apart with my little um, tool down there, and I pull out the first one. Now, this, one's gonna, this is where they're in, they're in the middle. There's nobody on the end, so I don't even know why people look. But um, this is where the action is. Be very, very careful because if your queen is here, you don't want to drop her and you don't want to hurt her. So, because she's expensive. If you if you kill your queen, you're gonna be spending about 25 bucks for a new one. So, um, what you're looking for your first visit is eggs and brood. At 21, at three weeks, 21 days, you should be able to see the first adults emerging. Okay, because as I said, 21 days for um, a worker. So this will be all perforated. Um, it's like that dark, that dark comb I showed you, but it'll be capped. It'll look like cardboard. And um, so you are, and you'll see some clear fluid, and you'll see some little grubs in there too. So you'll see all that. That's good. Now you actually really don't have to go much farther. I mean, if you want to see your queen, you really, really want to see, well, keep looking. But you know she's in there if you've seen that. If you aren't, if all you're seeing is just drawn comb and there's nothing in it, start looking for your queen. 
more than likely she's not there. And she's either left or she's died. And if she died early, there's no young eggs for them to do another, another queen. So you have to buy one. So call your supplier quickly and get another queen. It's not something you can just say, I'll do it next week, do it now. Because those bees will leave or will die without a queen. So um, anyway, and, and then they're going. You don't have, you know, I mean, you can go in there if you want. You can go talk to them, you know, uh, um, see what's going on. But probably your first time, you know, I'd go in once a month. Just make sure she's still laying, make sure everything's going well. If it starts getting really crowded in here, I mean, like really, it may, uh, probably by June, July, if you've got a great queen, it's probably going to get really, really crowded in there. Add another, add another box. If you really, really, really have to have that first year of honey, you can add that. You can add a honey super. But just be careful because if they build up too much, they're going to swarm. Swarming. That is when half your bees and your queen decide to leave. Now this is instinct. This is what bees do to propagate themselves. So it's just natural. But you don't really want that because you've just spent a lot of money on time on bees. You don't want half of them to leave. So there's a couple different ways. You can A, put up swarm traps and hope to catch them. And then you've got now two. But that's pretty hard to catch. They're, you know, they're kind of fickle. I have traps up all over the place and I have yet to catch a swarm. Um, you can um, add more space. If they have more space, she's going to go, oh, I don't need to leave because I've got more room to lay. Um, the reason they swarm generally is because they get crowded. They're, she's laying too much, there isn't space, and they got to go. Um, so adding another box will help later on as you progress your second or third year. You, you may decide you want to split them, and you'll take a box like that, or a big box, and take half your frames out, go buy another queen, and put whichever one doesn't have the queen in it, put the queen in it, now you've got two boxes. You're going to have to do this probably early in the spring because usually that's about the time they're getting ready to swarm. So uh, that's a little bit about swarms. Um, you know, add boxes as you need them. Uh, in, if you've all got your um, bees this year, um, chances are you, you, know, you won't get honey. I mean, you may. And, um, but what you could do is add two boxes and get a really, really good, strong colony. Give them a lot of food. And then next year, or when, when the minute you see those maples coming, like I'm late, I should have done this, this this weekend, but I'll do it next Monday. Get that, get this honey super on. So you know, Monday or tomorrow, I've got to go to around to all my because they're already blooming. I mean, what is up with that? It's January, but and it's supposed to be cold in February. So again, you got to have to monitor. But they're out there pulling in honey right now because they're getting a lot of nectar from those maples. And, um, and I couldn't, I'm kind of trying to decide, i got to look at them. If, um, if they're really low on stores, um, I may just let them keep the maple honey for their buildup. Because they'll use that then to build up. And then I'll have to put probably two of these on in March. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit. Um, I've got about 10 minutes to talk about pests. Um, it's really, really important that you um, do IPM, Integrated Pest Management. Um, that's where the big problem is with bees these days. We've got the small hive beetle, which that guy just mentioned. It's a little ugly beetle, and they're, they usually sit right up here on top. So when you open them and you see these little black beetles running around, you're going, ah, they're here. Um, not a big deal if you have a, just a small, you'll always find them because they're always they're going to be there. Um, this is called um, a beetle trap. You fill this about halfway full of vegetable oil, and you can just put this right in between your little frames here. The um, bees can't get in there, but the beetles will go in there and drown. And then about every week, you come out, just take that off, get rid of them, fill it back up, put it back in there. Um, the bees and the beetles have this kind of weird relationship. You'll see them all running around together. And you go, well, if it's a pest, why aren't the bees killing them? I don't know. They, like I said, they got some kind of thing going on. But either way, if you let them get out of hand, they make a mess out of your colony. If your colony's strong, you probably won't have to worry about it. You're going to get some. Every time I open my, 
Um, every time I open it, I have a little nail with a big flat, and I just go in there, I just start mashing hive beetles, you know. I mean, I'm, I am relentless, because I just sit there and mash them, I turn it over, I mash them, and when they run, you know, I go chase after them. But, you know, so far they've been pretty manageable. Um, wax moths, um, oh, I can't even describe anything more awful than wax moths. But again, if you keep very strong, healthy colonies, you should never see them. I mean, they'll be in there, but the bees themselves will keep the moths at bay. I mean, they'll keep them from taking over. They'll kill the larva, they'll kill the... I mean, so you'll, you may see them, but it's not going to be a big deal. Um, the most important thing are the mites. You have the varroa mites, and you have the uh, tracheal mites. Both are somewhat of an issue. No, not somewhat, a big issue. Um, there is a ton of stuff to use. You can use, there are lots of natural products. Um, some people use chemicals. And if you do, that's fine. But, you know, again, that goes back to rotating your, your um, frames out. Um, there is a stuff that I like that I use. It's called Apivar Life. And it's only sold by Brushy Farms. It is um, a thymol. A menthol type thing. They say, you know, they say it's all natural, but you know, thymol's still a chemical. So, but it smells okay. And listen, when they tell you to wear gloves wearing this, eh, you know, you kind of go, ah, eh, it's like natural pesticides. Is that? Um, so you know, you can decide what you want to use, but do something. I mean, if you have to use chemicals, use chemicals. If you don't do anything, they will die. Your bees will die because they can't battle them. And um, if you're thinking, just let Mother Ma Nature take, uh, it's, they're going to die. How do you know? Them? Can you see the mites? You can see the varroa mite. Mm -hmm. The varroa mite is like a tick. It attaches itself to the bee, and it sucks their blood. And it's a little red pin point, just a little teeny head. Um, and so uh, you, can, you can actually see them. You pick up your... Um, Thing. They'll be mostly on the drones, but you will see them on your bees. And if you're watching your bees a flounder along on the grass or something, and you look at their wings, and they have de this deformed wings, it's, it's called deformed wing virus, chances are that you have a very heavy mite load in there. And so, and you can check that. A lot of people do this. They put, um, they'll slide like a sticky, it's called a sticky board under here, and they'll just slide that under, and then what they'll do is they'll take a sugar duster with uh, powdered sugar, and they'll just go through and dust it like this. Well, the sugar and kind of causes the bees to groom themselves, and it also causes the mites to fall off. So in about a couple minutes, you can pull out that sticky board, and you'll be able to see the mites. And if you have a lot on there, you know, it's... You don't wait till after the honey flow to trim. Most of the time, you're going to do, you know, do this IPM right before winter. Don't wait if it's that bad. Yeah. Um, you were talking about what to do when you see them. Can you do these things preventatively before you see them, or you wait till you see them? No. They're there. Okay. They're there. So I, I don't even, I, to be honest with you, I don't even look for them. I just treat every fall. Okay. Mm. Tracheal mites, you aren't going to see. Mm. And the varroa mites, I mean, I've seen them. I don't think I have a huge um, problem with them because, I, like I say, I treat every fall. I mean, some people do spring and fall. Um, but um, if you do like the bottom boards, you know, and, and they're in a good location and uh, they're healthy colonies, you know, they can. And I do a lot, you know, if you, if you read, there's, and especially the internet's invaluable. My first, um, one of my colonies I got was a, supposed to be, um, what they call my, uh, mite resistant. And, um, and I, did, this is like my second year of beekeeping, and I looked at, I pulled out one of the frames in the spring, and there's all these drone comb, I mean, all the, you know, all over the bottom. I mean, just tons of it. And I'm like going, ugh. <laughs> so I take my little hive tool, and I make, and it's a mess, and I just scraped it all off. And I'm like going, eh, but bye, bye boys, you know. And so I scrape most of that off, and it is it's disgusting. Um, and then I put it back in there, and, I, and later I'm thinking, uh, did I do something good or did I do something bad? You know, and so then I read 
about it, and it says that a lot of people use that as varroa mite control because the um, mites love the bigger larva. And this is a bit, it's a big cell for the bigger bee. And so that's where they really like to propagate. So I'm like, oh cool, I did something right for a change. So now early spring I do go in there and I do scrape off all the ones on the bottom. If it's on the, on, on the, the side, I just shouldn't leave it. But it's good to reduce your drone population a little bit because that's where the mice really come from. There's other ways. And you know, as you read some of these books, you know, and this, it's a lot of info here and you'll just kind of go, oh, I don't know about this. Read a book. It's not that hard. It's fun. Um, the benefits way outweigh anything else, even the stings. Um, and it's so addicting. I never, you know, I thought, uh, I'll just start with two and stay with two. I've been all the way up to 17. You know, I probably, let's see, I'll have almost 20 this year. And, um, you know, and I vary. I mean, I had, last year I had a huge kill. I lost... 35% of my colonies, um, I had a huge, one of my neighbors or somebody used pesticides, I came out one day and half my colonies, there were hundreds of dead bees underneath them, hundreds. I cried, I cried, and um, I could tell looking at them, I mean you could just scoop them up by the handful, and I, looking at them, their little tongues were out, they died real fast, and so, you know, I knew it was pesticide. There, there's just nothing else. So I went driving around my neighborhood, okay, who's spraying, you know, who's got crops? You know, you don't, you don't know, that's just life. You know, I live, I live in farm country, people are gonna spray. And like I say, well, you know, just let me know when you're gonna use something really nasty. So I could, you know, and you guys, I don't know, in the last group we had guys that lived in Savannah where they mosquito spray. Does anybody have that here? Mosquito spraying? Because it will kill your bees. I mean, it, uh, if, if they aerial spray or come by with the sprayers, it, it will kill your... So you have to find out when they're going to do that. And then and what do you do? You have to cover your hive. So you, you use your entrance reducer. You know, let's say you know they're going to come in that day. I get, get out there before the sun comes up or at night. The night before they're going to come in, you lock those bees in there. You put that entrance reducer in there, don't look... So nothing can come out. You take this, and I put my hive cover right up against it so they can't get out. And you lock them in there for the whole day. Don't let them, I mean, don't let them escape, and, and you'll know. But you're at least, if any do get out, it'll only be a few. So, um, all right. How do you get the honey out? Do you have an extractor? I do, and um, to be real honest with you, if you get together, uh, you know, if we could ever get a bee club going here, and we got um, bee people here, you get get a, a big group of people in. I just spent a lot of money on a, on a um, uh, decapper. And I know a guy who's got a 10 frame radial extractor, so I'm hoping he wants to get together with me, and what we could do is whip out several, a lot at once. And then if we get a bunch of um, other, you know, bee people in, you know, People will share. This is great. This is a great tool. My husband got me this for Christmas. It came to Christmas. It's really nice when you're out there because you won't get the, um, when you're setting and moving your stuff around. You won't be getting all the garbage on on that. So you can set everything right on here, and it's easy. It's light. It's wonderful. So and once you start beekeeping, your spouse will never have trouble finding you stuff for Christmas. <laughs>